chapter 1. There's a critical passage that people do not distinguish carefully, a careful uh, critical difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. So let's talk about this day of Christ in the book. It is Appendix 4E in our book and on your chart, the timeline I gave you there. It'll be 4E, the day of Christ. That's when the rapture takes place, when the sun and the moon go dark. It's a busy day. Sun and the moon go dark, earthquake, angels come, blow a trumpet, catch the Christians out. All takes place one day called the day of Christ. That's the day our race is over. That's the day we're looking for, and I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writing to the Corinthian church says something very interesting to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 7. Uh, right page here, okay. Start with verse uh, 6. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm us, who confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the day of the Lord Jesus Christ is the day of his coming. That's the day we're confirmed unto that day. Race is over. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In this church at Corinth, which is a port city like New Orleans and a wicked city with every kind of sin you can imagine, Paul went there and started a church and got a bunch of people converted and they had a bunch of really heathen folks who are now saved and they're trying to live for the Lord, but they still had some pretty heathen practices in their church. One of the guys in the church was living in adultery with his mother or stepmother his father's wife. And so Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and says, what is wrong with you guys? Even the heathen don't do this. <laughs> okay? He said, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with power and the Lord with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here we learn a couple of things. You cannot possibly lose your salvation. You can lose your life. You can sin to the point where God kills you and takes you to heaven. You can, that you can lose. This guy was about to lose his life, but he was not going to lose his spirit. He was still going to heaven. And we see that again in 1 John chapter 5. There's a sin unto death. A Christian can sin to where God says, that's it, you're an embarrassment to the family, come on home. That happens, okay? Almost happened to this guy. But notice, this is the day of the Lord Jesus. When? When the Spirit is saved. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The next mention of the day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians <coughs> Chapter 1 and verse number 14. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. The day of the Christ is the day the race is over. That's the day the Spirit is saved. That's the day we rejoice. That's the day it's done, finished, finito. Now go to Ephesians, Philippians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 1. Three times in the book of Philippians, the day of Christ is mentioned. Let's see what it says about him. And don't confuse that with the day of the Lord. The day of Christ is the rapture. One day. The day of the Lord is a thousand year period. Okay? They're not the same. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started to work in you when you got saved. He's going to perform his work until the day of Christ. Race is over. We're done. Going to heaven at that point. Verse number 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's all we got to do is make it to the day of Christ and the race is over. That's the finish line. And by the way, Indianapolis 500 does not have a prize or a trophy for the shiniest car at the end of the race. 
they don't have a prize for the car with the best running engine at the end of the race with the highest compression. Doesn't matter. They don't have a prize for the car with the least dents in it, do they? Just who can get across that line first? Doesn't matter. And some Christians are more worried about keeping their car shiny than they are about getting something done for God. Chapter 2, verse number 16. Philippians chapter 2, the third mention of the day of Christ. Verse 16. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That's the day we rejoice. Race is over. Now go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this will show you something very interesting if you're a Bible student. 2 Thessalonians, all the T books are together, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus, and they happen to be in alphabetical order. Who cares? Another rabbit. Okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, there's no question this passage is talking about his coming. And by our gathering together unto him. Okay, that even takes away any doubt. This is the coming when he gathers us together. Verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. And I think all Bible scholars agree that apparently somebody was writing letters and signing Paul's name to it. And Paul said, don't you get discouraged if you get a letter that looks like it came from us. Because it didn't come from us. If you get a letter that looks like it came from us, verse number two, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, if you have just about any other Bible version, including the New King James, they have changed that to say day of the Lord. How many have day of the Lord in yours? Okay. They changed day of, because, <coughs> because of this next verse. <coughs> verse number three. <coughs> Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The day of Christ, talked about in the verse before. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The day of Christ, the rapture, cannot come until there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. Well, the man of sin is revealed in the middle of the tribulation, when, in the green part, when he sets up the abomination, and the Jews finally realize, that's not Christ. He's a bad guy. But at first, they're going to think he's wonderful. He gave them a treaty. He got them to rebuild their temple. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when he sets up that image, and they realize, whoa, nobody sets... The Jews haven't learned much down through their history, but they have learned, don't worship idols. They finally figured that out after going into captivity a bunch of times and getting beat up. Don't worship idols. Yes, Lord. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Next lesson. Okay. And when he sets up an image, possibly some kind of computerized artificial intelligence, I don't know. I know in the last 20 years, it's unbelievable what's happened with computers and microchips and stuff like that. Can you imagine what three or four more years is going to do? Could they get a robot that actually thinks and talks? I don't know. They're all, maybe they've got it already. We'll have to wait and see on that. But during this green period, when the abomination is set up, that's when Antichrist sets up his image and says, y'all bow down and worship my image. And that's when, well, like Nebuchadnezzar set up the image of the big statue, you know, six, uh, 90 feet tall, made out of gold, and said, y'all bow down and worship that. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not doing it. But there were 10,000 young Jewish men taken captive to Israel. Only three didn't bow. Where were the other 9,997? Face down in the dirt, bowing to that image, weren't they? We're going to be amazed how few Christians stay true to the Lord during this coming tribulation time. Is it going to be you? Is it going to be me? I don't know. It's easy to say, yeah, I'll stand true. <laughs> Wait till the bullets start flying. You'll see. Okay, so <clears throat> the day of Christ... <clears throat> cannot come until there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. There's one more inference to the day of Christ. Not doesn't mention it directly. Go to 1 John, way at the end of the Bible. 1 John, not John, but 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1 John chapter 3, just before the book of Revelation. 
1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth him not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he appears, we're going to be like him. Paul said, I can't wait to get rid of this body that causes me to sin. Romans chapter 8, I want to do right and I do wrong. Oh, who can deliver me from this wretched man that I am, you know? And if you've been a Christian for a long time, you probably understand, the closer you get to the Lord, the worse you feel. Because you see every sin in your life. A person who thinks they're a pretty good Christian is probably not very close to the Lord, okay? You know, the closer you get to the mirror, the more you see the zits and the imperfections and, oh, brother, you know, right? You want to really see him get the bright lights on in a mirror. Oh, man, what happened there, you know? Okay. When the closer you get to the Lord, the worse you're going to feel, and that's a good thing. Because then when you do get up to heaven, you're going to fall down on your face and say, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive riches and honor and power and glory. He's the only one. So the day of Christ is the day we rejoice, the day the race is over, the day we become like him. That's the rapture. That's the day of Christ. Don't confuse that with the day of the Lord, which has two distinct parts to it. The time of wrath and then a time of great blessing. Well, how long is this time of wrath? Go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and there's a very interesting clue that I missed for 40 years, even though I'd read it a bunch of times. I missed it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, chapter 8. Preacher, this is the key that made it all click together like a big Sudoku puzzle. Oh, wow. The nine goes in the corner. Ah, got it. Solve the rest of the puzzle. Daniel chapter 8. He's asking him, how long is the temple going to be desolate? Verse number 13. Then I heard one saint speaking unto, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake unto him, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 2,300 days. Now, seven years breaks up into two halves that are each three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, because they figure 360 days per year. They use what's called the prophetic year, 360 days. So that's three and a half times 360 is 1,260. So this, this seven-year period is broken into two halves of three and a half years each. Sometimes it's called 42 months. Sometimes it's called three and a half years. Sometimes it's called time times and the dividing of a time in the book of Daniel. And sometimes it's called 1,260 days. But he asked this guy, how long is the temple going to be desolate? He said 2,300 days. Well, hold it, 2,300 is more than 1,260 by 1,040 days. The time of desolation of the temple is this red arrow. It runs right past the rapture. We're caught up out of here, and I think I've got slides on that. If you got them up there, fellas, do you? That red arrow is the time of the temple being desolate. It is desolate for 2,300 days it runs all the way past the rapture, right here's the rapture, we're caught out, for an extra 1,040 days. What's well, almost three years? Two years, 10 months, 20 days for you technical folks, okay? Thousand, we'll call it three years, round it off. So the temple is desolate for a total of nearly six and a half years. We're here for the tribulation time. We're caught up out of here, but the temple is still desolate. Satan is still in control for an extra 1,040 days, about three years. This is the time that, now the day of the Lord begins at the rapture. It's his, it's the day of the Lord, but he's not done cleaning house yet. 
And there are several parables about that where the man went away and the people said, we don't want him ruling over us, and he had to come home. It took him a while to clean house and explain to the guys in a language they could understand. That's mine. But So for the next 1,040 days, or about three years, this is the time of great wrath, when God pours out his wrath on the world. This is when the seven vile judgments and the seven trumpet judgments take place. And all kinds of bad things happen on planet Earth. And then the Lord returns. See, we are caught up together with him in the clouds. Oh, I think I've got that. I guess, let's see. No? We're really working on the PowerPoint, folks. Sorry about that. <clears throat> anyway, on your chart that I gave you, if you look on that instead, at 4E, letter E, we are caught up into heaven. That's the rapture. That's the day of Christ. 4E, the sun and the moon go dark, the rapture takes place, and we go to the judgment seat of Christ. There are two judgments mentioned in the Bible. The judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. And it's not to determine if you go to heaven or hell. That's already been determined or you wouldn't even be there. This is to determine your rewards. Are you going to get gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble? And he's going to give you your rewards based upon why you did what you did. See, God, is he judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. He not only knows what you do, he knows why you do it. And maybe you came to church one Sunday. Yay, great, wonderful. That's a good thing. You're going to get a prize for that. But why did you come? Well, because you felt like you had to, because people would think bad about you. Oh, well, then you did it for the wrong reason. Or you wanted somebody to see your new tie or whatever, okay? Or notice your new car or something, okay? Or find a boyfriend or girlfriend, okay? He will judge the motive of why you did what you did. And your reward is either going to be gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. And then it says he's going to try everything by fire. So your wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. It's not going to abide the fire. Now, you're still going to heaven, but you're going to lose all your rewards that you worked so hard for. Some people have worked hard all their life doing things, going to church, giving money, but they've done it all for the wrong reason. And they're going to have a giant pile of rewards and say, oh, wow, look what I did, everybody. Hey. An angel's going to say, excuse me just a minute. Uh, We've got to check this out. And down drops a quarter. Here you go, sir. There's your silver. <laughs> now, I, all I can look at is your giant pile and say, wow, he looks like a really good guy. But God sees the reason why you do what you do. And that's all in Corinthians about the rewards being tested by fire. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine if you go to heaven. It's just to determine what rewards you get. Now, the foundation, no man can destroy. The foundation of Jesus Christ you're building your house on that foundation, and that won't be destroyed, but your house may be totally destroyed one day. And some of the people that you think are the greatest Christians on planet Earth are you're going to be totally embarrassed when you see what really happens in their life. And some of the people we've never heard about are going to be the ones that get to stand at the front of the line. Come on up here, Grandma. Here's your pile. You've been praying for these folks for years. Folks, this is Grandma Jones. Nobody ever heard about her on earth. But she's one of my prayer warriors. Let's all stand and give Grandma Jones a hand, you know. I think Judgment Day is going to be very interesting. That's the, that's the, the judgment seat of Christ. It's only for believers. After the judgment seat of Christ, we go to what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And for that same three years, or 1,040 days, when the wrath of God's being poured out on earth, we're up in heaven enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. A three-year wedding reception. Now, there was a king in the book of Esther who was loaded with money. He had a big party to impress his guests, and the party lasted 180 days. Six-month-long party just to show how rich he was. That's a pretty good party. Jesus' party is going to last three years. Okay. These kings got nothing on him. And after the marriage feast of the Lamb, then we return on a white horse. See, there's actually two parts to the second coming of Christ. The first time, he only comes to the clouds and catches up the Christians. Second time, he comes all the way down and touches down on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives splits in half, and a valley's opened up. 
and a river pours out from under the temple. Ezekiel talks about that. And it's going to fill in the whole Dead Sea, the whole Jordan Valley. Most people don't realize the Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. The Dead Sea is 1,300 feet below sea level. If that whole valley filled in with water, the Dead Sea would come to life, fresh water. If it got a little deeper, it would overflow and come out south of Israel at Elat or north of Israel at Mount Carmel. Israel would have a natural Suez Canal right next to Jerusalem. We cover all that in the book. I don't, sorry, I don't have PowerPoint ready for that. But the marriage supper of the Lamb, we go, we spend 1,040 days, we actually become the bride of Christ. And I don't understand all that. Okay? Maybe each person gets to be a part of the body based upon how faithful they were. <coughs> Would you like to be the toenail? <clears throat> I'll let you do, use your imagination on that. Okay. Um, so when he comes back, the second half of the second coming, or called the, the second advent, is when <clears throat> he comes back for the battle of Armageddon, and Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Satan has been causing trouble since Garden of Eden. Finally, not the lake of fire, at the, gar at the Battle of Armageddon, he's cast into the pit. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, near the end of the Bible, the last couple chapters. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. Revelation 20, and verse 1. <clears throat> and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. How can you have a bottomless pit? I just, I just like to think my brain once runs wild on things once in a while. Bird comes flying through and I grab it. You don't know what you got. They open your hand. Oh, that's a cool thought. You know, if you drilled a hole completely through the earth, completely all the way through, and you drop something in, it would be pulled down, go to the other side and be pulled back, and would be constantly falling back and forth through that hole with nothing to stop it. Go out, come out into in, uh, Indian Ocean someplace, whatever the opposite side of Dallas is. You can look on a globe and figure it out, but... Drop something in, it'd go all the way down. Come, it'd be like a yo-yo going back and forth, a bottomless pit. Never stop. Maybe that's what it is, I don't know. Uh, but he, Satan is cast in, uh, verse number two. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Beheaded. You know, there's a lot of different ways to die. Who would kill people by beheading? Huh. The souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they, that's the ones that were killed, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be princes, priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up to the, on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was, no, was found no place for them. <clears throat> and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things that are written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This second judgment, the first one is the judgment seat of Christ for Christians only, <clears throat> right here. This one, the great white throne judgment, is where everybody appears and everything you've ever done or said or thought is going to be revealed for the world to see. Unless you've been saved. Then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. So when they call my name, the atheists are going to say, aha, uh -huh, now we get to see the real hope. And the angel's going to say, this book's empty, Lord, clear, no sins. No sins, I knew that. Yeah, shut up, I said no sins. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God for the blood of Christ. And if you don't have that on your record, you're going to be in trouble. Look at Matthew 12, 34. Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4. Matthew 12, 34. Matthew 12, verse 34. <clears throat> O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I can tell what's in your heart. It comes out your mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes out your mouth every time. Verse 5. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Can you imagine if God played back on judgment day in front of everybody every word you have ever spoken? He will. Unless the blood of Christ has washed away your sins. Okay, So if you're not a Christian here today, we are going to all get to hear every word you have ever spoken. How many of you would be embarrassed if every word you have ever spoken was played out loud for everybody to hear? Okay. <laughs> How do I get that tape and erase it? Whoa. Well, that's the blood of Christ does that. Praise God for that. So this great white throne judgment is going to be an extremely interesting day. And after here, people are cast into the lake of fire. Now, that's not the same as hell. Hell is the temporary place that holds people for 6,000 years until this great white throne judgment. And then death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, which is a different place. See, hell is temporary, until a holding place until the judgment and then you go to the lake of fire. It's sort of like when you first get arrested, you go to jail. Then you go to trial. After trial, if you're found guilty, you go to prison. Prison is for long-term holding. Jail is for temporary holding until trial, theoretically. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> they moved me to a bunch of them. Whew. Anyway, so for now, if someone dies without Christ, they go to hell which apparently is in the center of the earth. It's the only clue I can, several clues in the Bible seem to indicate that's where it is, but I wouldn't argue over it. But someday we're going to come before this great white throne judgment, and those people in hell are going to be then cast into the lake of fire, which is, it, and all the verses are about it right here in the Bible if you want to read that. So I was guilty of, for years of confusing day of Christ and day of the Lord. They're not the same. I was guilty of confusing tribulation and wrath. They're not the same. We are not appointed unto wrath. We are here for the tribulation. So this timeline shows we come back down here at 5C, the middle of this, not the middle, but I broke the thousand-year period up into five parts also, A, B, C, D. The first thing that happens in that thousand years is 144,000 Jews are selected to be witnesses. That's in Revelation chapter 7. Remember Revelation chapter 6, the sun and the moon go dark and we're caught up to heaven. The first thing God does is pick 144,000 Jews and he seals them in their forehead so they cannot be hurt. <clears throat> During this time of wrath, they are going to be witnessing all over the world. Even in, when God's pouring out his wrath, he still remembers mercy and wants to get people saved. Even during that time of his wrath being poured out, he still wants to get people saved. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody saved. Some people just simply won't do it. Okay, go to hell then. <laughs> but if you want to go that bad, that's, you're going, okay? But Jesus has done everything he can do. 
He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He sends out preachers. He lets people beat him up and persecute him and throw him in prison for no reason. And, and he, he's trying to get the message to you. How many guys in the military will go risk their life to go rescue some other guy, you know? And he's a hero when he does that, and he should be, and that's wonderful. Just think about if God called you to be a missionary someplace where it's dangerous, and you go in there, you get some people saved, and they end up killing you. Like uh, happened to the guys down in the Alka Indians down in Ecuador. They went down there in 19, what was that, 54. Nate Saint and those guys went to Ecuador to try to reach him with the gospel, and they killed him, all five of them. So their wives went in there and, and started a great ministry down there. Elizabeth Elliot was one of them. She's on the radio, Christian radio all the time. So <clears throat> I don't know what God has for you to do. Everybody ought to have some kind of ministry that you can do for the Lord. You better get alone and say, God, what do you want me to do? Start, start a left-handed, one-eyed ministry or something. I don't know. Find, find something, okay? People often ask me, Kent, did God call you to do this? Speak on creation and dinosaurs? I, I don't know. I never got a letter or a phone call. It just needs to be done, that's all. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll go. And maybe God's got something for you. I've often said, look, if you're not going to shoot, at least carry bullets for the guy who will shoot. And if you, okay. <laughs> and if you're not going to shoot or carry bullets, maybe God's calling you to pay for the bullets. Hmm? Yeah. Everybody can do something for the Lord. The worst of you could serve as professional bad examples, if nothing else, okay? What's your calling? I'm a professional bad example, okay? <laughs> find, find something to do for the Lord. There are many things that we ought to be doing now. We ought to be, my whole Appendix 7 of the book is, what should we do? Well, Peter gave all kinds of advice. Jesus gave all kinds of advice. Moses gave all kinds of advice. Joshua did. We've got all kinds of people's advice in here. What should we be doing? It's really pretty simple. Exactly what he always told us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Get people saved. And then teach them so they can go out and get people saved. See, the Christian life is really simple. In the physical world, you get born because of what somebody else did. Okay, You have nothing to do with that. Or you get a free gift of life. Absolutely free. You have nothing to do with it. You got a gift. Now you grow because of what you do. Eat, sleep, exercise, take vitamins, whatever, okay? That growing takes a long time. And that does require your efforts. And then you get a certain age and you start to you reproduce, you make more babies. So they can do the same thing. So you get born, you grow, and you reproduce. It's the same thing in the spiritual world. You get born again because of what Jesus did, not what you do. Then you grow because of what you do. Get to work, read your Bible, pray, get going to church, you know, confess your sins, try to keep clean. Then pretty soon you look around and say, you know, I want to tell somebody else about this. And there is no greater joy in the spiritual world than leading somebody to Jesus Christ. I got addicted just a few months after I got saved. When I led my first soul to the Lord, I said, wow, I want to do that again. It's been 46 years and I still want to do that again. It has never worn out. And if you've never led anybody to Christ, you have no clue what you're missing. And I would encourage you to go find somebody you can talk to about the Lord. If you can't get you a big one, get you a little one. I bet you could find a 10-year-old kid that would listen to you. You could explain, hey, kid, you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell. But Jesus died for you. He wants to save you. Would you like him to save you? Yeah. Get one of the tracks on the back table out there. I think I got I gave them all out. Get a gospel track and say, oh, here's one. And say, hey, you can pray and ask the Lord to save you. If you don't know how to do it, just read the prayer off the back. There's no magic prayer, but that's how I led my soul, first soul to the Lord. Reading a prayer off the back of a track. I don't know what to say. Here, read this. Okay, so we read it together. But once you get addicted to winning souls, then you're fulfilling the real purpose of your existence on earth. See, if Jesus just wanted to get you saved so you can go to heaven... He would have taken you to heaven right after you got saved. He's leaving us here to get something done for the kingdom. I would be willing to bet there's a hundred people within one mile of your house that have never heard about Jesus Christ and that need to hear about it. Within one mile of your house, there's a mission field. 
somebody you can win to Christ. Go get them. What, what on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? If you got to heaven and God piled up all your rewards, how much would withstand the fire? I don't know. I know Daniel chapter 12 is one of the verses that motivates me. Turn to that one. Daniel chapter 12. And we'll have Q&A time here. Sorry about that going over. Daniel chapter 12, verse number 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. How many people have you turned to righteousness? If it's nobody, well, get to work, soldier. There's a job to be done. Quit worrying about the stupid bowl and who runs around the cow pasture with the football and start winning somebody to Jesus, okay? <laughs> we get distracted with the dumbest things. What have you done for the Lord with your life? If I can help in any way, we want to. If you want to get my videos, make all the copies you'd like. Copy them. Give them away to people. People will sit home and watch a video that you will never get to come to church. Especially if you say, hey, you want to watch this video? No. I'll give you 20 bucks if you watch it. No. Nah. Give you 500. Okay. Okay, now that we've agreed you'll watch it, let's go back and renegotiate that price, okay? <laughs> How about 10 bucks, okay? Or five. Find something to do. You could be a video missionary. I don't know, but just I would ask that each of you just examine your heart. Say, God, what do you want me to do? What can I do for your kingdom? Lord, show me my job. Doesn't every kid growing up in every family have something to do, like, you know, take out the trash or sweep the sidewalk or feed the dog or something? That's part of being in the family. You all got a job to do. Okay, well, you're in God's family. What's the job he's got for you to do? I don't know. I'm busy doing what I think he's got me to do. You go figure out what he's got for you to do. But let's, go, let's all get busy and do something. I, I have heard, there's a rumor going around, that you have some heathen here in the Dallas area. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Well, go find them and fix it. Okay, go get them. All right, let's pray. Take about a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back. Q&A time. You're going to line up at the mic so the guy can video both if you have a question. Any questions are fair game. We'll go until 6 o'clock with Q&A time or later if you want. I've got nothing to do but drive to Florida tomorrow. Uh, so, And there's a whole lot more we have. This is kind of an oversimplification. Hopefully, these papers we passed out will help you get kind of the big picture of the second coming of Christ, which really has two parts, the rapture and then the return to the Battle of Armageddon. Feel free to take all the pictures you want. If you've got a cell phone, take pictures of the chart, or you can get the chart. Uh, Theodore, don't, don't we have it up as an, like an e-book kind of thing? I don't know what an e-book is, but I've been locked up a while. But, I, uh, <clears throat> but you can, uh, I know a well, hardback book will be available here in the next week, so sorry about that. We didn't get them in time, but you can get it downloadable somehow. Uh, and then somebody, who was it, printed out the whole book, downloaded it, printed out the whole thing. You got it there? You didn't bring it today, okay. It probably cost you more to print it out the pages than it. No? Okay. Almost a ream of paper. Yeah. There's a lot in there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these people. Come spend their Saturday afternoon, Lord, learning about your word. I pray that they've learned things that will change their lifestyle, if it needs be. Get them motivated to win souls. And, Lord, help us each to find somebody we can witness to and talk about you. And Lord, there's, there's many people that need to be turned to righteousness, so help us to get busy and do it so that we can be counted in your book as wise, as the ones who win souls. Lord, please move in every heart now today. Get something done with these lives here. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, about a 15-minute break, brother. We'll start up again at quarter till. Okay, thank you. If you didn't see the airplanes, kids, come on out. We'll make some more airplanes. Dismissed.